Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you, um, Nicola. Thank you also to the organizing committee. Uh, seven is my lucky number, so it's good to have this uh, this talk here, and actually bring you back to the uh, the human microbiome, which is actually in your intestinal tract. Uh, I always say only ten centimeters from your heart, you will find it. And I think uh, we don't have to go anywhere in the uh, in the ecosystems around us. Uh, it's all uh, uh, within us, and it's good to to look at that and what it means for us, how we can modify it, and how we can actually capitalize on the fact it contributes to our health. So that's what I want to do in this uh, in this contribution. Um, give a little bit of short uh, introduction, also uh, address questions like why we have a personalized microbiome and where the microbes come from, and then also give uh, three examples of how we can improve our intestinal microbiome uh, for the benefit of, uh, of human health and the quality of life. Uh, this slide is just to acknowledge my sponsors. It's good to uh, take uh, actually you to the the, the, the journey and time that we have been doing also in the in the human microbiome project and meet ahead to uh, actually make the, the, the framework of the uh, human microbiome as we know it now with all this uh, 10 or more million of genes uh, as well as uh, microbial cells which outnumber our own cells and include many species uh, i'm not going to detail that too much and jump immediately to our complexity which is very high uh, in our microbiome uh, and, and the discovery we made already almost um, 25 years ago, that we have a personalized microbiome. That was done uh, with the first uh, analysis of uh, 16 s ribosome RNA, published a paper with Aaron Zutendahl, my first PhD student in this area. And uh, what uh, he also found is that uh, uh, we look at the temporal variation, which is uh, sort of uh, the, the highlighting the stable microbiome in an adult uh, individual, which actually is... Uh, uh, much more different from the, the unrelated individuals. But the monozygotic twins that we analyzed in that study were also quite similar. So actually, uh, the twins were more similar to the spouses that lived in the same uh, same household, which I think is something which uh, I will uh, come back to in a, in a sec. Um, we have this, this large cohorts now. This was on the uh, pioneer work, I would say, with uh, only a dozen or so individuals, or a few dozen. Uh, now we have thousands of microbiomes, and we all have uh, found uh, that uh, they're different. We have a collection of uh, more than 10,000, uh, which we analyzed in the same platform. They're all different uh, and shows, of course, some core microbes, which are present in the, uh, in the, in the population. I will also come back to that later. Um, and um, we have this, this personalized microbiome, which is also affected by many confounders. Diet and drugs, as we all know, are very important uh, confounders and affect uh, the microbiome. So we have to uh, to be careful if we have large cohorts that we correct for those confounders because they actually uh, may uh, may really affect our results. And in that respect, I have to say that in spite of the enormous amount of publications, we still are in the early days to understand what it all means. What I want to uh, explain to you very briefly is why we have this personalized microbiome. Well, basically, we are born virtually sterile in, in early life. Uh, we have this rapid development of a microbiome in early life in the first uh, weeks already. I will show you that later. And we already uh, we already discovered this maternal inheritance already also more than 20 years ago. You can see here a text of a paper with uh, Christine Favier, who was a postdoc at the time, uh, where we uh, looked at the, uh, the bifida bacteria, the maternal inheritance heritage that we, we discovered there. Uh, and that together with the fact, so the maternal uh, transfer, as well as the fact that uh, we take the, the simple ecological principle that um, Bayerink and Basbeckin discovered, everything is everywhere in the environment selects. And that actually explains that we have this personalized microbiome, where you have uh, zillions of mother baby transfers, uh, as well as uh, the fact that the family environment uh, plays a role. And a recent paper of uh, Nicolas' group together with Jura's group actually shows that very nicely. Uh, and Mireia is uh, coming back in one of the other uh, slides later on. So I think this is a very important discovery that we have this vertical transfer and then uh, influence of the, of the family and, of course, other environmental aspects. I will show you that in a minute when I especially talk about C-section babies. Now, having said that, um, what is our model? How can we sort of uh, structure our hypotheses in, in a model. And this model I, uh, uh, I put forward already quite a while ago. And I just want to go through with you because it hasn't changed. It's still uh, valid, I think. We start on the left-hand uh, corner here on the 10 o'clock. Uh, we have a homeostatic resilient microbiome, which is stable and personalized. Talk about adults. 
And then you can sometimes have these early warning signals, tipping points, which uh, I will show you in a minute, uh, which also are manifested by uh, low-grade inflammation, more LPS uh, producers and LPS in the in the serum, which may lead to tissue destruction and all kinds of uh, catastrophic shifts in the microbiome as well as in the host, which uh, uh, is affected and gives chronic disease, chronic disease, disease development. But this is sort of a, a locked-in situation. Uh, those errors are reversible, but basically the chronic disease development is something which actually is a, is a sort of dead end. You can't get out. Uh, but you can change the microbiome by microbiome restoration and increase the resilience and go back this direction. Here I want to, uh, to give some attention on uh, later on in my, in my presentation. So what is important is that we get more insight in the mechanisms of the tipping points and the early warning signals which are there. And then actually with my, uh, my colleagues, uh, Patrice Cani and, and Herbert Tilk and Matthias, we made a recent review in, in GUT, and you can look at that, where we uh, uh, looked at actually all the uh, diseases which are there. I'm not going to summarize that, but there's a, are the associations of, uh, of the microbiota uh, in, the, in the gut together with the number of diseases. One actually is not there, and that came out uh, actually last week, a couple of papers on the uh, uh, cardiometabolic health. And here we see already tipping points, uh, evidence for the fact that things are changing, microbiome is changing, metabolites are changing before the cardiometabolic defects are being manifested. And I think that does also support for the tipping point uh, uh, hypothesis, uh, which is further supported by some other data, which I'm not going to elaborate here. Now, here's a, a picture of uh, a an healthy gut and a compromised gut, and you can see all kinds of beautiful arrows and, uh, and molecules. Butyrate is an important signaling molecule. I will come back to butyrate producers later in my talk. And here you can see all the compounds that are made and have an effect and a sort of uh, established mode of action or, or the juice mode of action in the human body. One is here again, this LPS, this levopolysaccharide, which is an endotoxin, and a number of uh, short chain fatty acids which are healthy, branch chains which uh, fatty acids which are not desired, and a couple of other things here, including the uh, secondary bile uh, acids, and I will come back to it also later. So this is a bit of uh, uh, our idea about the mode of action and molecular signal in our gut, but still we have this, uh, this uh, model and uh, how can we come from uh, correlation studies, which are manifold, uh, like I indicated, the cardiometabolic uh, disease to causation. We really need that causation studies in order to not to be wrong-footed and not have the confounders which are all there and making our life difficult. Now, how to come from this uh, correlation to causation? Um, yeah, we don't have so many approaches. Our uh, our technology book, uh, box is quite limited. We can, of course, do the binary comparisons like everybody's doing, health and disease, and have uh, epidemiological data, looking at the, in the back mirror, longitudinal analysis, uh, like the cardiometabolic stuff, uh, development of disease, and so on. But this is all not causal. So the only way to go to causality is to do microbiota targeting therapies. Um, and a little word about uh, model animal studies. I love animals. I love mice. Uh, but it doesn't bring us so much. Um, uh, we have to be really careful in uh, extrapolating mice data to human data for a number of reasons, which I reviewed with uh, one of my postdocs, Flor Hugenel, some time ago. And the human cohorts, I'm still working on that. So I don't say that it's all not good, but I think the uh, uh, we, we work actually in Finland on, on um, uh, a baby cohort. But it's, uh, and I will come back to that later, uh, still, uh, I think uh, cohort studies are useful, especially in early life, because things are developing there, as I just explained to you. But the, the, the therapies actually are, are more relevant to discuss in this uh, moment of time, because they may uh, point to causality. One is the fecal microbiota transplantation. You're all aware of that. Long history of, of use, um, sort of safe use even, uh, from the uh, Chinese traditional medicine. Uh, many cases uh, have been uh, described, mostly single cases, and we started out doing some more structured uh, work in the Amsterdam Medical Center uh, about 10 or more years ago already, where we started to, uh, to look at the uh, effect of FMT in C. diff infections, recurrent C. diff infections, and found that if you can falcomycin, which is the normal treatment, or a lavage, or a lavage with FMT, that only in the latter case the, uh, the, uh, the, the critically ill subjects actually are being cured. Vancomycin gives about 30% uh, healing, Lavai similar, Lavai FMT 98%, whatever, you know, almost complete curing. Uh, indicating in this case 
that bugs are better than drugs. And I think it's good to think about that, how important this has been, because it really gives some idea that really we can change health by changing the microbiome. Now, what happens there is, uh, it was analyzed by uh, Suzanne Fuentes, another also postdoc in the lab at that time. And uh, uh, if you take a look at the networks, and those are microbial networks, uh, correlation networks going up and down, the same uh, way of, of the microbes and the different individuals. The donor has a lot of networks, as you can say, that's a healthy donor. This, the recurrency uh, subjects have almost no networks. They also have a low diversity. We all know that, uh, full of uh, antibiotics. Uh, and then when you do the... Uh, the uh, transplantation, you can see a healthy, uh, I would say, uh, resilient uh, ecosystem being recovered. And that is also the basis for the recovery of the individuals. Also in line with the hypothesis as I put forward in my model. Now, what about this fecal microbiota transplantation? I'm still working um, with Max Neuter upon that. Uh, and um, a recent review actually looked at some of the, uh, the mechanisms which are there. So it's increasing diversity, affecting bacteriophages, affecting metabolism. Uh, an important point is looking at gut, gut permeability, and improving a leaky gut, uh, modulation of the immune system, of course, and also gut brain axis are, are all effects that you can, uh, can uh, I would say, ascribe to the FMT. In the recurrency diff, it's the methods of choice, which... Uh, are, is really used all over the world. And one thing which I want to mention, we followed the people in time, looked at the donors and the recipients, and did a deep meter genomic analysis together with Pierre Borg and look at the, the SNP uh, or the SNF uh, analysis and found that, yeah, one stool doesn't fit all, as I could say. These are five individuals. Three of them were transplanted with the same, uh, same donor. And you can see this is uh, up to about uh, three months uh, stability of the uh, the donor only and the recipient only, and you can see the donor is, uh, is the, the the orange one is disappearing quickly in the three months. But in this case, the donor stays, and also in this case, even the donor even more even more prevalent, indicating that you know, uh, like I said, um, the host also makes a difference. It's not only the stool; it's the host microbe interactions that play a role here. And it's good to remember that, that it's not, not only the donor, and you can think about a super donor, but then uh, the host has to be taken into consideration too, as you can see here. Very simple in, in terms of stability of the, uh, of the organisms that are uh, har uh, harboring and, and, and establishing themselves, at least for some time in the, uh, the, 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 after the transplantation. Now, those are all trials, and actually all the trials in the literature are trials with adults, which, uh, which have at this climate communities, which is a large amount of uh, bacteria in the colon. So what about babies? Now, stepping back to the uh, early life again, uh, we are born ster uh, virtually sterile, we have this uh, early life colonization, and basically, in my opinion, that is a programmed microbial outgrowth. So we're not continuously uh, I would say colonized. We in the beginning we also colonized uh, by the mother's microbiota, and that's not one microbe. There's many microbes, and I will show you evidence for that. Now, if you look at the metadata of a lot of studies, and that was done by Katja Korpela, first a PhD student, the later postdoc in the lab, and she looked at about uh, whatever thirty or so studies with a few thousand babies. And if you look at the uh, development in time, this is a log scale of about 24 months. Um, you look at proteos or uh, bifidobacteria or clostridia, you see similar patterns. Actually, there's a bit of a bias in the, in the, uh, in the world, but basically there is a, there's a really uh, quite nice high p, uh, low p-value uh, similarity between the development uh, trajectories suggesting that we are species, we human, we have a microbiome which is different, but there are mechanisms which govern all, all of us. And that has to do with the, uh, the, the antibodies we make, the antimicrobials that are present in the, in the breast milk and the human or milk oligosaccharides that feed the microbes. And of course, there are differences there between different uh, mother baby pairs, but in general, a similar uh, trajectory can be seen as is shown here. This is not the case when we look at C-section delivery. You know, cesarean section delivery doesn't uh, have a vaginal uh, uh, 
canal, which is uh, is passed by, it's immediately taken from the womb. And this is a a practice which is uh, taken over in many countries. You see in Brazil, um, this data from WHO, so I'm uh, uh, from the Lancet paper. Uh, Actually, it's uh, it's quite uh, astonishing that here and also even in Egypt, Turkey, there's enormous amounts of C-section babies uh, being reported. uh, And actually in many other countries, it's uh, increasing. Finland is here, it's about 20% here in Finland, and we have cohorts that we analyze, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, what happens with the C-section delivery? There's, a, I would say, a, a, a real effect on the early life colonization. This is, again, the same scale, up to uh, four months here of uh, bacilli, proteos, bifidobacteria, and others. You can see the bifidobacteria uh, in the red is the C-section. They're delayed compared to the, uh, the, the gray one, which is a normal one. Uh, by the same token, you can see that the Bacteroides is almost absent in the C-section babies, higher in the uh, in the vaginally delivered babies. Uh, a similar aberrant or aberrant profiles are also found with antibiotic-treated uh, kids, but I'm not going to detail that. But then we know from other studies that we have published that it uh, really uh, uh, predisposes for other defects like uh, higher BMI and asthma, uh, other autoimmune diseases. Now, here I'm not going to talk about it, but C-section, we know, also has a link with a variety of autoimmune diseases, and we see clear differences in the trajectory of the microbial development in early life, especially in the first, whatever, few months. Now, the question is, can we change that? Can we correct this pervasive effects by, for instance, an FMT of the own mother's microbes? The answer is yes, otherwise I probably wouldn't have had this uh, this presentation. We published that uh, last year, I think. Uh, we carefully selected uh, mothers. It has to be done, do to try this at home. Uh, seven out of 17, we store the samples. We have a few milligrams of the sample we gave, about 10 to the five or so cells in the first uh, breast milk feeding of the of the, the babies. This was done all in Finland uh, with my collaborators here on this uh, on this. Uh, paper. Uh, it's a safe and well-tolerated uh, manipulation. Uh, we need the stringent, uh, stringent uh, screening because quite a few of the mothers have uh, GBS, a group B streptococci, so you don't want to give that to the baby. Uh, but the ones that we selected, which were free of viruses and other, uh, other um, pathogens, um, had a healthy uh, and uneventful development. Good to know that. And then what happens with the microbiome? You can see it very much here. This is a PCOA where you have the uh, uh, C-section babies in yellow, the control group actually from our Helmi cohort. Here we have uh, C-section FMT in red and vaginal in blue. And the red and the blue are overlapping, as you can see. So basically, we correct this uh, marker biome, and this is uh, sort of visualized in this little cartoon. Um, this was all with the ethical permission that we needed. It's not an, uh, an easy thing to do this. It's a, it's a proof of concept uh, study where we really can see that the, the, the microbiome of the mother uh, is a source of microbes in early life and early life colonization. Now, what is happening there, if you look in detail, here we have three groups, vaginal blue, C-section red, and C-section FNT black. So look at the black versus uh, the red lines, for instance, the Bactodetes. Black is normalizing it, uh, so the FMT is normalizing it, and the C-section babies are almost depleted of the bacteroides. Before the bacteria, you can see that also in later uh, uh, moments, the, uh, the FMT really corrects that. And an important point here is the pathogens. Uh, there's also um, a good studies uh, there of, uh, of our colleagues in the UK, where the number of pathogens were found to be higher in C-section babies. We could confirm that, and also could see when we did the FMT, we could suppress that. Now, I want to say one thing is that uh, really we can see this uh, this happening. Um, this is not the same as with the vaginal seeding. There have been studies with uh, Maria de Mangos Bello and others. There's a, st- a recent study in, 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 in New Zealand uh, where they try to mimic the uh, maternal transfer by vaginal seeding. The answer is it doesn't work. And that's uh, shown in the Nature Medicine paper, but uh, uh, not well concluded. We have used the data and reanalyzed them in our, our cell paper. But this study in uh, New Zealand actually showed it very clearly. Vaginal microbiota, uh, vaginal seeding uh, will not work in correcting the uh, defects of C-section. We also saw this was more effective than any probiotic supplementation. We have worked on that before, but the FMT is really important. And I spend a bit of time here also to indicate that this 
actually supports the maternal transfer of fecal microbes, microbes in early life. So basically, we have this mother to child transfer, and we have evidence for that, that this is happening. Now, we did a bit more work. We uh, worked with uh, Nicola and also uh, Mireya, uh, together with Anna Salon, who's uh, doing this cohort of, uh, of the Helmi, which I just mentioned to you. Uh, we looked at the, uh, the SNPs, uh, SNPs, SNPs uh, from the, uh, the different strains that we could found, find. And here you can see in early life, three weeks time, you see the, uh, the, the, the similarity of the uh, vaginally delivered babies. And this is the C-section baby with the red arrow. And the red arrow uh, goes to green, the green arrow after the FMT. And you can see it normalizes completely. Same holds for the three months. In a year time, it's uh, also uh, normalized. You can look at the median here. So really, we can see that the mother strains are colonizing the newborn baby, both in the vaginally transferred baby as in the um, uh, FMT uh, baby, indicating that this is really uh, the normal way of colonization. And I think it's good to, to remember that. We're now looking at what is the role of the family members, especially the father, because we also uh, look at that in detail. And uh, soon, I think you can, uh, can see that in the literature. Now, having said that, uh, what are the solutions? I want to uh, step away from the FMT and the last, whatever, 20 minutes or so, I want to talk about uh, um, microbes and molecules and the next generation of beneficial bacteria, especially ones that do something with the ileum and with the colon. So two examples are here. The ileum example is, uh, is actually based on an FMT we did with uh, Max Newdorp. Here is this picture, uh, where we looked at metabolic syndrome individuals and uh, did an FMT there. And looked then after the FMT, what's happening there? What's happening with the, uh, the responders, non-responders? What do we do? What uh, can we see? What kind of bacteria are there? And we actually analyzed the ileum rather than the colon. So in the ileum, we found a specific organism called uh, Eubacterium halii, later renamed uh, Anaerobacterium syngenii, which is a, an organism which is uh, capable of using sugars, making butyrate, but also making uh, butyrate from lactate and acetate. And this uh, organism we tested in, the, in a mouse experiment and that worked. So we also did some human experiment, uh, also, and I will show you details of that, and also that works. And... Um, and we did uh, quite some work, uh, Sudar Sanchetti actually is probably on, online too, has been doing a, a lot of work on this organism. This actually was uh, spun out in a company like um, uh, Nicolai indicated, Silas Health, founded this Max, and actually the uh, uh, development of this organism is uh, sponsored by Nestle as a collaboration of a global development uh, program. Now, what did we find? We actually did a study design in, uh, in human, uh, preceded by a mouse study in order to get the, uh, the safety dossier right. Uh, in the human study, we took uh, uh, metabolic syndrome individuals, uh, we gave them an intervention, and looked at uh, uh, peripheral uh, insulin sensitivity with a clamp, and we found dose-dependent improvement of, uh, of the, the insulin sensitivity. We also see that the, uh, the, 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 the endogenous in Halii, which are there in fecal samples, are being uh, taken away. They're replaced by the, uh, by the newcomers, and there was no adverse effects, which is important, of course, for the whole safety. So here you can see what happens there, and, and the, the strain is uh, sort of taken over from the, uh, the, the strains that are present there already. An important point is that uh, not only we see an improvement of uh, the health of the individuals, we also did the deep meter genomic analysis and found that the replication rate of this uh, um, Ihalia coming out or uh, Anderbacterium sugeni coming out is really much higher than the endogenous ones and actually uh, relates to the, uh, the dosing of the strain. So here we have a good example of, uh, of a candidate uh, beneficial bacterium, but we took it one step further. And the third was to look at the mode of action. Um, and for that, actually, I have to take you back uh, because I had some use since I worked with uh, like Plantarum and also LDG on the early, uh, on the on the duodenal uh, gene expression. So what we do is we go in with a tube, release the uh, organism and look at the gene expression. Now, we did a similar approach. Uh, this is what you see them. And you have a lactobus, by the way, it's an immune signaling uh, response that you can see here. We did the same with this um, Arobuturicum sungenii. Papers published recently, you can find it in GUT, did a crossover study, either Sungenii first and control and other way around. And that was used to do a lot of technology. 
actually here was only a res, uh, gene expression response, but here we looked at all kinds of things we could measure, including uh, uh, continuous glucose measurements, uh, all kinds of things to, to be measured in the serum and the blood and, 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 uh, and, the, and the gene uh, expression in the duodenal extract. Now, having said that, what comes out, uh, a lot of things are happening in the... Uh, in the, in the duodenum, where you looked at the placebo versus treatment, there's an enormous amount of genes being affected, especially uh, uh, rec one b which is, uh, has to do with re regeneration of pancreatic beta cells. So it's relevant for this, uh, uh, I would say, this uh, whole, I would say, idea that a single dose, in this case, of the bacteria will have an effect on the uh, systemic uh, health. We see the serum uh, Bile salts going up here, we can uh, see the secondary bile salts. I mentioned that already in the beginning is one of the signaling molecules in our gut. We see, and that's very important, the hallmark of, uh, of, uh, uh, of in a way, health is, uh, is in this case uh, the, the, the GLP-1, which is a hormone which also relates to uh, insulin sensitivity. And actually, there's a couple of signaling pathways taking uh, care of that. And uh, here you can see a model proposed for the small intestine, where especially the uh, the secondary bile salts via TGR receptor have an effect on the uh, on the GLP-1. Now, that's probably the pathway we have here. We see also butyrate going up in the fecal samples from the single dose, which also makes sense because also butyrate is a single molecule. And uh, uh, the hallmark of the, uh, I would say, homeostasis of insulin is the uh, the, the, the continuous glucose measurement, and here we can see that the variation of the glucose levels is going down significantly, indicating that the, the, the subjects, uh, the metabolic uh, syndrome subjects, become better. So that's a, a sort of idea about this uh, metabolic syndrome and the effect of the mode of action. Um, we take it a bit further. I want to, your microbiologist, so uh, just a little bit of a tour on how to develop this. Uh, we first grew it in the right way. We uh, patented the process. Uh, Sudarshan looked at the uh, pathways in the uh, organism, and we grow it uh, quite uh, rapidly on, on sucrose. It's good for industrial scale. So we did this large-scale fermentation, anaerobic production, the right uh, downstream processing and formulation that you have uh, capsules with uh, live cells. Uh, they also stay alive. I mean, they're room temperature stable, and the trials are ongoing on that. And uh, we did a step further. We looked at the safety, did a 90 days uh, rat study and all kinds of tox studies use the decision tree that is used by uh, by uh, FDA, actually uh, 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 developed that. And if you tick all the boxes, you have a safe product. And that was also the grass, uh, self-affirmed grass that we received recently. So here we have a product that we could go to market. And I wanted to show you this because it's not only to, to, to have a, uh, a product in the in the in the laboratory. We also have to make it and test it and have large scale studies and those are ongoing. This is one example. I want to finish off in the last uh, 10 minutes or so with another example. That's the Akamanzia story. Also alluded to by, um, by uh, Nicola. Um, a very interesting one because it uh, starts with Akamanzia, which was discovered by Muriel Derian. Uh, she, uh, she was a PhD student in the lab. Uh, she may be also online listening to this because it's one of our bacteria really where we started from the beginning with the hypothesis that uh, we should look at uh, specific bacteria and go to the to the yeah to the human body. Um, this organism we started to uh, to look at because we wanted to know what's happening in the mucus. We know that we produce enormous amount of mucus per day, about uh, grams in amounts, and uh, the data supporting that this is not uh, you know secreted in our feces. So there will be microbes growing on it. So the question was what microbe is doing it, and we found Akamansia to be the most prevalent one, uh, actually abundant in the mucosal layer, uh, dedicated user, low in all kinds of uh, uh, diseases. It's a vertical microbium, so it's quite a, a special organism. Um, it's a quite a nice microbe, and it talks to us. We have um, done a lot of work here on the physiology with the respiration, HMO utilization, and gene expression, all kinds of things in the germ-free animals and organoids and in the volunteers. I'm not going to detail that. So you can find it in the literature. This is how the organism looks like. But we, uh, we know now, uh, after uh, we discovered it, many papers actually are highlighting Archimansia, and it's uh, linked to... Uh, to, to fasting and gastric bypasses and health in general, where uh, whereas the level is increased in many diseases, especially 
obesity and overweight. It has the high, uh, the, the big letter C because many studies have been addressing that. But we all know from the literature, everybody is doing the same thing. So uh, that's the reason we see this uh, high level here. Uh, there are uh, other uh, aspects too that our commands you can do, which are a bit overlooked, but I'm not going to detail that. Here's the uh, the, the publication of Akamanzia, it's uh, increasing all the time. And I did a very, yeah, I did a sort of the collaboration together with Muriel and Patrice Cani. Patrice is uh, working in Brussels and he has a fantastic uh, uh, set of uh, uh, technology for mice. And what we did is uh, we used the diet induced obesity mice and give them yes or no Akamanzia. Now, when you have that, uh, you can look for instance, the fat mass. If you have a, a mice with a controlled diet, they're not fat. You get them a high fat diet, they get fat. If you get high fat diet, Akamansia, they're not so fat. I mean, you kill the Akamansia by uh, sterilization, uh, autocovation, it goes back again. And here you have the data on the LPS. Again, this lipopolosaccharide I mentioned before in the serum of the mice, control mice low, high fat mice high indication of inflammation, body inflammation, high fat, uh, high fat with Akamansia, you can see it goes almost down to normal. So the barrier function is reconstituted and is reinforced by the Akamansia. If you kill it, it doesn't work. So this is, uh, well, it looks like magic. So we repeated that many times. Uh, also, in interestingly, other groups repeated that. So uh, we still, still really believe that this is happening. We know that it's a barrier function which is uh, established, but also it uh, triggers mucus production and uh, TRX signaling. So it has an immune and metabolic function. Now, having said that, we took it a bit further. We uh, did uh, some other studies uh, with uh, Patrice and um, uh, his postdoc, Hubert uh, Plovier and others. And we found that not only live cells are doing it, but also pasteurized cells. These are gram negative organisms. So you can pasteurize them 70 degrees and they're all dead. And still at that moment, the cells are still active. You can see that in the studies like here, you have the LPS again, uh, the same experiment as before, control diet, you know, no LPS, high fat diet LPS. You get pasteurized uh, live cells here, you get pasteurized cells, all a reduction of the LPS. Now, how can it be? Now, to make a long story short, there's a specific protein, which we call AMUC1100, which is uh, present on the, uh, on the cells of, uh, of um, Akamansia. And this protein mimics this effects. It's a heat-stable protein. So the 70 degrees may not affect it, especially when it's on these cells. And you can see when you add that, or, that uh, protein, the same uh, effect takes place, no LPS in the uh, serum. Now here you can see effects on the body weight. You can see even that the uh, uh, AMUC 1100 has the, the highest effect on the body weight. On the right hand side, you see all kinds of things uh, like the junction proteins in the ileum or unionium. So the upper GI tract being affected. And this is all in line with the fact that the barrier function is increased. Uh, Andre Maret made a nice news and views about that in Nature Medicine, so you can read it all. And uh, uh, recapitulating the fact that uh, this protein in 1100 may be the driving force of the mode of action. It's a uh, protein which is on the, the pili of um, Akamansia. It swims with uh, type 4 pili and it's decorated with um, this protein. So it also sticks out and goes to the uh, human cells and may explain the mode of action in the human body. Now, having said that, an important invention was the pasteurization, which uh, makes sense because pasteurized cells are easy to sell, easy to go to, uh, to, to market. And I'll come back to it in a minute. And all the data together actually comes to this little cartoon that we already published some time ago, where we have this Akamansia sitting in the mucosal layer. We know from uh, Gunnar Hansen that this is a sterile layer. Uh, and the reason is that there's an enormous production of mucus all the time, but dendritic cells and other cells may, uh, may stick out and have toll-like receptors. And uh, we know that this uh, uh, AMUC protein, I did say that, uh, yeah, it's not here on the slide, actually is uh, signaling to the toll-like receptor 2 and actually um, uh, evokes a uh, response, which you can see here, which uh, has to do with uh, immune signaling and also uh, reinforcing of the barrier function. So this is the way we think that at the moment uh, Akamansia work, works. There may be other molecules, but in the pasteurized cells, the uh, AMUC 1100 is the, uh, the causal uh, uh, candidate, as we have here, uh, whereas in live cells also the uh, metabolites may play a role, and also trophic chains that we have uh, shown to be uh, reconstituted with uh, Akamansia and, and butyrate producers, for instance. 
Now, this also with Nicola, no, it's good, he's the chairman. We also looked at uh, a number of genomes, uh, uh, as well as meter journal assembled uh, genomes, uh, which are present in the databases. Uh, we all can uh, look at that. And we found that there is a number of Akamansia groups, but all, have, all of them have very high 16S ribosome RNA, or ribosome RNA similarity. There's a little bit differences now and then, also in the coding capacity. You can see it all in this paper, which uh, came out recently. Uh, some make B12, some don't make B12. An example is, for instance, uh, Akamansia glyconifola that makes B12, which is a uh, an, uh, the only, uh, I think, described uh, other species of Akamansia. We found it in the python, and it's really different, whereas uh, uh, the mice and the men and many animals have an Akamansia mucinifola, which is almost the same as we have in our body and your body and my body. So we have this uh, unique and conserved uh, um, symbiont, which is present in the mucosal layer, and does the same thing in probably all of us. Having said that, we wanted to develop it a bit further. Uh, did the same thing as with the Anoputricum sungenii, took the strain, did the genome, made the model. Um, uh, this is a model of uh, the first model we had, the second model came here, a bit improved. And when we did the modeling, of this uh, organism, we found that there's two defects. There's actually an uncoupling of the glucose pathway here. You can't see it; it's very detailed. Uh, and uh, and the glucosamine and the endoscopic glucosamine GlucNec uh, pathway here. But we need GlucNec for the cell uh, envelope uh, for the cell wall. Uh, so if you grow the cells on glucose, they don't grow because they need GlucNec. But if you grow them. Uh, together with glucose and, and the amino sugar like Glucnec or Galnec, you have a very nice growth. So that's a, a very good uh, improvement of the uh, of the medium because we cannot grow Akamansia on uh, on mucin. You can't go to the market with that. So this is what we did. We also did the toxicological safety again, like uh, with uh, Anobacterium syngeniae, also the tox studies. And recently we also um, got uh, permission to go to market. And this is uh, an experiment we did with this produced uh, bacteria. We uh, did a, a metabolic syndrome study. Uh, like I said before, uh, it closes the barrier function. And we see that also here in this study. Uh, maybe first uh, uh, a little bit of an idea what happens. We uh, treat the, uh, the the patients with, or the subjects, not really patients, with um, Akamansia. And before and after the intervention, you can see a difference in the Akamansia DNA because also the live cells come out, but also the pasteurized cells that we used here come out. But there's no effect on the uh, overall microbiota. Um, and the safety was shown actually, for instance, by looking at the liver enzymes, you see them even going down with the pasteurized cells. The pasteurized are here in, in yellow. Here we can see the uh, insulin resistance going down, also uh, quite significant with the, uh, with the pasteurized cells. The serum LPS, again, also in human, we can see here that the LPS goes down, especially with the pasteurized cells, and also the serum cholesterol goes down. So all the, all the hallmarks of the metabolic syndrome are affected, and um, we can conclude that the pasteurized cells uh, really work. Uh, they are good, even better than live cells, and that also led to the um, the safety, uh, uh, I would say, approval of pasteurized Akamansia by EFSA, European Food Safety Authority, and that uh, together with the uh, the company I founded with uh, uh, Patrice uh, called Amansia Biotech, will uh, help us to bring this uh, product to the market. Having said that, I think time is up. A uh, little bit of outlook. Here's the model. I think I'll give you all the evidence for that about the tipping points. Uh, Leo Latti published a paper about the tipping points and early warning signals in the human microbiome uh, about five, six years ago in Nigeria communication. So we have the evidence for this. We also have the early warning signals, give you evidence for the LPS, also for the chronic disease development in this direction, and the FMT that can help in this, this direction to go back to the homeostasis. Um, what's next? Yeah, my favorite actually is look at uh, synthetic microbiomes, not only the single uh, microbe, but uh, multiple microbes. Actually, uh, following uh, Richard Feynman saying what you cannot uh, make, you cannot understand. I think we have to create new, uh, new consortia to see what we can do. Uh, do the reverse engineering, select the right microbes, make multiple strains and set in the communities. We have a lot of information there, you know, on the mechanisms. Uh, we can develop tomorrow's medicines for that based on, uh, for instance, on our large uh, cohort studies and uh, uh, core microbiota. Uh, Sudar Shashetti uh, looked at a, a specific uh, synthetic microbiome that uh, will come out soon in, uh, in biofilms and microbiomes. 
where we have our, you know, first, I would say, really grasp on how a uh, consortium would, uh, would react and how the cells or the cells of the different uh, species uh, talk to each other. Um, what is next? Actually, for all of you, this is a very important area. It's, we still, a little bit in the beginning, okay, we progress every year. Um, uh, we go towards radical innovations in the microbiome research because we have a lot to, I would say, to gain in the microbial diagnostics. I know many of you work on that, but also in microbial therapies, like I indicated here, that can be for food and can be also for pharma. And actually those areas are part-time growing together. But I have to, uh, to warn you, best is to go for causal effects in men. I showed you in this presentation that is not easy, but I think it's the only way to go forward and not only uh, to do uh, work in the lab and work in mice, but actually think what would it mean for the health and quality of life of people. And that uh, I think we have a lot of new concepts that come from this uh, lab studies. We have uh, quite a number of new technologies that we apply. Uh, actually, the whole metagenome um, uh, work that was uh, promoted by MetaHate is an example of that. And we also have new paradigms. I showed you on the model, uh, which I adhere to, and I think is still valid. Uh, what is important is to, to go for the molecules that have the active uh, role, look at the mode of action, and try to capitalize on that. And I, I'm very happy to answer questions on you and take you with, uh, and give you advice on how to uh, take this road from the, uh, the drawing table and the, and the microbe and the discovery to finally the, uh, the large scale production. Akimanzio I produced on the 20,000 liter scale. So it gives something that uh, dimensions that you come from the micro leader and the microbe to the large scale. And I think that's uh, where we have to go in order to make any of those radical innovations. Thank you very much.